Okay, we are live now. <laughs> it's confirmed. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Terrence Fleming and I am the development manager with Red Panda Network. And this is the second first Panda Forum. And I'm really excited because today we're here with Angela Gladstone, who among many things is a zoologist, a world red panda expert, and the governor of the Red Panda Global Species Management Plan. And we'll get into what that all means later. And Angela also happens to be the chair of the Red Panda Network Board of Directors, which is, we're really fortunate to have her on our team. Um, so I'm just gonna give a, a, a short introduction about the long list of achievements uh, that Angela has had in her long career in uh, conservation and zoology. She's actually been on our board since 2014. And this is really exciting because Angela is a well of knowledge when it comes to red pandas and zoology in general. And she's also been a significant part of global red panda conservation efforts. Uh, which includes raising thousands of dollars for our mission and our uh, specifically our forest guardian program. And as we go through this chat, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So Angela received her PhD um, in, and she studied mouse lemurs at the University College in London. And I really want to talk to her about mouse lemurs because I, I know red pandas are cute, but uh, mouse lemurs are also really cute. And she also, Angela also worked with Rotterdam Zoo for a long time, where she established the International Red Panda Stud Book. And if you're like me, you may not know what that was or what that is. I didn't for a long time. And now that I do, I see how significant it is. And we'll talk about that more later too. She's also worked with the International Union of Conservation of Nature on the Species Survival Commission and CITES, which is the International Convention on Trade in Endangered Species, um, all on behalf of red pandas. And on top of all that, she also started our incredible red panda EEP forest guardian program, which we'll also discuss later. Um, but today we're gonna talk about one of the books, she's actually edited two, but one of the books is this, I mean, probably the most thorough red panda textbook in the world. Um, it's, it's really amazing and it, it's just so helpful for anyone who wants to learn everything there is to know about red pandas just about. Um, so yeah, so lots of achievements. If you have any questions, please leave them as comments on our Facebook stream and we'll leave some time at the end to answer them. Um, but yeah, let's, let's jump right into this. Um, I guess it'd be great to know what was your role in, in the publication of the book and what was it like to, to work on it? And I'm, I'm um, talking about Red Panda Biology and Conservation of the First Panda. That's the book I'm talking about. Well, I, as you said, I, I'm the editor, which means essentially I had to invite all these people and persuade them to write chapters and then try and bring uh, all the information together and make a sort of uh, synthesis of what we found at the end. So it, it covers m many topics of which I'm not so familiar. We've got some information on um, fossil fossils and the evolution of red pandas in there, as well as more uh, zoo related things such as captive breeding and diet and veterinary care and, and field data as well. Um, We've got some uh, studies from red pandas in the wild and discussions on reintroduction programs. So it covers a multitude of things and my job was to find people who'd like to write about those things. Oh wow, so you actually found the people who wrote the book? Yes. Oh, very uh, cool. Felt very flattered that they would agree to, to write a book for someone they'd never heard of. So I'm, I was very happy that that went quite well. Yeah, that's so cool. What was the process like in finding the writers for the book? Well, so, some of them, of course, I knew because I'd read their work. 
um, and some I'd found online when I was looking up information like, like for example, on uh, evolution and fossils. Um, I, I found some names. Some people were recommend, would recommend people on other topics. And one or two people wrote and said, could we write something? So it was a sort of a, a whole raft of different ways that people got in touch. That's so cool. It, it, it sounds like it just became like this intersection of Red Panda experts and science and conservation. And so was it, was the inspiration just that there wasn't really a book like this and you just saw a gap that needed to be filled? No, no. Um, someone had, had obviously thought about this and thought, suggested to a publisher that I might be someone who might be interested in in putting together a, a book like this. I hadn't dreamed that this would happen. So I was really excited when this guy told me he'd approached a publisher and then the publisher approached me. So I, I see, okay. excited about it. Yeah, that's really cool. So how long did the process take? I would say a good year, I think. Oh wow, okay. Well, uh, probably I met the publisher in the autumn of the previous year and I started working on it. We put together a proposal and then uh, probably from the January of that year, the next year, I took till about October, November, I think, till it was all finished. Okay, so it took you a year to edit, but I mean, this is a, this is a huge book. I'd imagine putting together all the, the, the content probably took more than a year, I would, I would imagine. Well, I have else. to remember that lots of other people wrote it. Right, so, right. So, you know, you know it's there and you approach these people and ask them to please kindly submit something by the end, a certain date. Gotcha, okay. And then, then you put it, you know, make comments or say that this disagrees with so-and-so's chapter, what do we want to do about it? Right, and that actually brings me to, to my next question, which is what are some of the what were some of the challenges in, in writing the book or editing the book or publishing the book? I'd imagine making everything sort of consistent and like you said, sort of mitigating any, any conflict, you know, conflicting information in the book would probably be something that. Yeah, I think that was the most and, and occasionally nagging people who were taking a bit too long. <laughs> right. Right. It was also, but I, I, I think I was very lucky with my authors in general. It went very smoothly. That's um, so cool. That must have been such a, a unique experience. It was, it was. It's, it, it's a lot of work, but it was, yeah. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would imagine. I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have, have, you know, wondered how, you know, especially like a, a scientific textbook is put together and, um, and I'm sure you got, you know, some, some in-person insight into that process. Yes, and you, you get to know these people a bit as well through email. So it, yeah, it's, it's an interesting process, yeah. Very cool. So rumor has it, there's gonna be a new edition of the book released soon. Yeah, well, soonish. We're working on it. <laughs> okay. um, it hopefully should be released in the first half of next year. I'll put it that way. Um, some of the chapters are arriving a little late and sadly they're my chapters, um, but ho hopefully most of it will be done by the end of this year or at the end of January anyway. And then the publisher has to then uh, put, the, put, you know, put the whole thing into a, an attractive format. And I have to, maybe that some chapters are too long, I have to also check that. There is a length given to the book, uh, which wasn't given to the previous book. No one told me it had to be so many words or so many pages, but this one has a limit. So we have to see how that goes. I see. So what will be some of the new information in the book or some of the, the updates or revisions? I mean, you have to think the last one was nearly 10 years ago now that it came out. And, you know, there's, there have been changes, there have been new discoveries, there's a new, new chapter on, uh, for example, on reproduction. The chapter on fossil evidence is being updated, so I'm assuming there have been some new and interesting finds. Um, what else is there? 
there, there is a revised veterinary chapter because you know the, the our knowledge continuously develops in, in that area and, and also for example the chapter on culture when the last book was written we didn't have twitter we didn't have um pinterest or one of the instagram and these are things where red pandas are exploding not literally of course but um, <laughs> their images are, you know are everywhere now and in the last book we suggested that maybe social media was one way of making the general public more aware of red pandas and then more interested in the conservation but of course the downside of that could be that they're so cute and cuddly everyone wants them as a pet right right yeah it's 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 a little complicated right because of their appeal as a pet which we all know they don't yeah. make good pets um but so one of the topics that's been pretty popular these days is the idea that red pandas are two species as opposed to there being two subspecies. And will that be included in, in the new release? Uh, yes, we're going to, I've got a, a geneticist or two geneticists who are going to <clears throat> discuss the, the, and evaluate the study. Um, I mean, I think uh, somewhere in the 1920s, uh, a guy called an American guy called Oldfield Thomas first suggested they might be two separate species, and he based that on color and upon on the size of the animals. But that then disappeared out of popularity in, in the first Red Panda book. Um, again, it was suggested by one of the authors that they might be two separate species. Uh, and so the, the, this idea has obviously been growing for some time, but there is no set process on how you decide that something is two species. One paper doesn't decide that. It has to be um, a general consensus of experts. Um, and I'm not quite sure how that eventually works out, but in the book, we're going to at least discuss the pros and cons of the, this idea and also how it might impact on their conservation and their status in the red data list. That all sounds really important. And yeah, that, that sounds like a, a very sound process of deciding whether they are two species or, or, or subspecies. And obviously them being two species, um, as, as you sort of mentioned, does have implications when it comes to conservation um, efforts and, and whatnot. So I, I wanna talk about your time at Rotterdam Zoo because Rotterdam Zoo is, is one of our incredible partners. They, they've supported some of our, um, just some of our, you know, keystone projects. Uh, I mean, the, the color study, our mammal survey, um, the, the camera trap survey, and among many others. And uh, you spent a significant amount of time at Rotterdam Zoo. And I would imagine your, your time at Rotterdam Zoo equipped you for being able to edit such a, you know, important and thorough scientific book on red pandas. Um, so I, I guess a, a, as much as you can sum it up, what was your experience like at Rotterdam? I mean, I know you started off as a biologist, and then you, you, you know, ended up as, as the conservation coordinator. Um, yeah, just tell me about it. That, that is a... Um... Sort of, sort of such an open question it's very <laughs> yeah. I mean I think in general it gave me some amazing opportunities to um, do work that I probably wouldn't have been able to do in another job I mean I was given time to for example edit the first red panda book I was not the one you were holding but an earlier one I was given the ability to invite experts over and hold discussions in, in Red Panda meetings, and that was supported by the zoo. Um, I, they let me visit some of the panda habitat. They paid for my, my travel um, to visit the panda habitat and to talk to people who, who were working with red pandas in the field at that time. So I, I think generally uh, they gave me an incredible opportunity 
and I can't imagine many other jobs that would give you that opportunity to explore various aspects of, of bread panda behaviour and breeding and uh, care and husbandry. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Uh, where did you go to visit red pandas? I went in. I went to Nepal very, very early on. I don't like to even say how long ago it was. <laughs> Um, when I went to uh, the Sagamatha National Park and I met some very interesting Sherpas up there who were telling me that they saw red pandas much less than they had when they were kids. But the closest I got to uh, red pandas was a pile of red panda droppings on one of the paths. Got it. So you didn't see any, uh, yeah. any wild red pandas uh, in the flesh? And I have also visited Sikkim, which is one of the Indian states, and West Bengal, which is also a state with red pandas. So I've visited those two areas where they also uh, exist. But again, I saw them in, in Sikkim in the zoo and in Darjeeling in the zoo, but I haven't seen them anywhere in the world. Well, Red Panda Network is currently at 100% sighting rate. So we need to get you over to Nepal once, once we're able to do trips again because uh that sounds like a plan last time <laughs> I did try, try a trip but it was in the end of the rainy season it was extremely slippery <laughs> I yeah like yeah a... we'll make sure to avoid the monsoon season yeah for <laughs> sure cool so I, I know that you worked with uh hoof stock which i'm assuming is ungulates right like yes yeah, so the rhinos and the, the antelopes and and the pigs and the giraffes, all of those. <laughs> cool. And then, so how, how did you move on to red pandas? I, I started with red. When I, when I went to Rotterdam and I just finished my research for my uh, mouse lemur thesis, I was looking for something because I was a biologist. So I was there to, to do studies and publish things with the zoo's name on it. And the first, um, you know, I was, didn't want to do any more mouse lemurs and I wanted to do something different and I saw these animals in an enclosure just near the, the gate to the zoo and I knew what they were but I couldn't find very much written about them and that was Rotterdam's red panda so I started thought that was a good thing to study because if no one has studied them you're going to get it published. That makes sense I mean I, I mean you're su you're such you know, a global expert of, of red pandas, at least from where, you know, where I sit. And I mean, when you, when you started, were you one of the few people that were studying red pandas or even one of the first, do you think? Um, well, I mean, there, there had obviously, you know, been studies going back to Hodgson in the mid-1800s. Right. 1800s. right. Uh, but, uh, and there were a couple of studies in the field uh, that had taken place, um, with uh, with a couple of an American and a Canadian scientist, uh, there were uh, so in in zoos there was Miles Roberts who worked for National Zoo, uh, who who published some work. So there's a guy who'd worked in Switzerland, but he only published one one thesis, and and there was a couple of, of publications out there, but not a lot. And wow. the field very very general. So. It sounds like you were still a, a red panda science conservation trailblazer. Again, at least from where I sit. <laughs> but and one and one of your remarkable achievements was establishing the international stud book, which I would love to I'd love for you to be able to kind of explain what that means exactly because when I first heard about it, I didn't really fully understand what it was and I, I didn't fully see also what the significant was of it, but because of, of zoo's roles in, you know, the zoo, the zoo community's role in, in conservation, the stud book is actually, is very important. Um, so can you tell us, first of all, what is the stud book? And second of all, what was it like to establish it? Well, uh, a stud book for red pandas is just like a stud book for domestic cattle or a stud book for pedigree dogs. It records every animal that you know of that's living and it records their date of birth, who their parents were, um, uh, their date of death, their cause of death. It, it just gives 
the relatedness of, of you know if you can imagine it's it's a, a family tree of all the red pandas that were in zoos and it i actually did it because my then director came up and said wouldn't it be a good idea to do a stud book if you're looking at you <laughs> and you don't say no you say yes so that was a very good idea right. um, <laughs> <laughs> so i started doing the stud book and of course in those days now everything's on computers in those days it wasn't on computers so every animal you issued a stud book card which had on one side it had you know their their number you give them a number a name if they had a name uh, where they were born when they were born and all that and if they were transferred to another zoo it would say that on the stud card and the stud card would go with the panda to the, to the next zoo so it had a, a card record that traveled with it until it died and then it returned to the stud book keeper um, so you did that and then you had a yeah more or less uh, a well it wasn't even an excel file sheet i mean you, you just had lists of all these animals and their parents and you organized it and you had someone type it up for you um, and, and then because you're tell there, you know you can see how many animals were born each year so in those days the reproduction was very very bad and the death rate of, of young pandas was too high so then you start talking to people and trying to find out which zoos were successful and what they did that was different from the zoos that weren't successful so gradually the stud book also um, started to publish advice um, on, on what you're doing and what you're feeding um, as, as the animals became uh, more successful also uh, helping people uh, who had bred their red pandas suggesting places where they might go um, and, and zoos that were looking for them so it, it's a, it wasn't quite a breeding program that existed later because essentially it was too small scale but you were helping zoos uh, find out information on, on the animals they were keeping how to keep them and maybe how to form new pairs and things like that Interesting. Okay, so it sounds like not only did the stud book track the pandas themselves, but it also provided best practices for zoos. It, it so developed they can, that it, in the in, in the first stages. You know, you send out a questionnaire, and you say, and you go go back and say, it looks like that if you hold red pandas in with one male and two females, they don't do as well as if you hold one male and one female. You're, you're, you're giving information without giving guidelines. As right, right. And I'm, I'm assuming this is part of why zoos have been more successful at, at um, keeping and breeding red pandas. Well, I say it took a long time. It took <laughs> uh, 15 years or so before they really got going. I mean, right. it, was, it, was, uh, it was until that time, very first analysis, I mean, I think in the first stud book I published an analysis with the help of a, a university graduate who'd done some statistics on populations and things and at that time it looked as though they were going to die out in about 10 or 15 years because the death rate was so much higher than the birth rate wow so, that's so, that's crazy yeah. so it, it you know if you'd asked me you know in the first 10 years of the stud book, if I thought we'd ever get a successful breeding program, I'd have probably said no. Wow, that, that's amazing. We've really come a long way. Wow. Have, yeah, it, the programs have developed a lot. And yeah. zoos are more uh, rece receptive to comments and, and to you know, take advice than they were when I started. That's really cool. Well, kudos zoos. Kudos to the zoo community. So when you weren't busy developing this critical stud book, what other animals did you like working with besides red pandas with, well, with your time at Rotterdam? <laughs> I mean, when I became, uh, I, after some the research part, which was a lot, lot of red pandas, but some studies of gorillas and other things. But when I started working with the hoofed animals, 
I think one of I had two favorites I think one was the giraffes because there is nothing cooler than going into a stable in the morning and they sort of lean over their fence and nibble your hair I mean it's just they're such gentle animals they are I, I had the pleasure of, of feeding some giraffes and their tongues are incredible yeah <laughs> so, yeah those and the other one are visayan warty pigs um, okay. uh, which are a very rare pig that come from the philippines and the males develop this wonderful big punk hairdo in the time of the year when they mate and then it all falls out till the next year and and they they again they they're such they're such nice nice animals they're so sociable and and the males are so gentle with the piglets it, it's just just nice animals to work with what are they called visayan warty pigs cyan warty pigs Vis visayan from the visayan islands in the philippines right. okay got it <laughs> yes never heard big. of them no you wouldn't but they're a very rare pig <laughs> Nice. And, and they have the males have these warts on the side of lumps on the side of their faces. Yeah, they're just yeah special. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they sound like their their characters. So this is great. Yeah. So if you're just joining us, this is the first panda forum. Uh, this is our second first panda forum actually, and I am Terence Fleming, and I'm here with Angela Gladstone, and we're both with the Red Panda Network. I am the development manager and Angela is the chair of the board of directors. So if you have any questions, please leave them as comments on the Facebook live stream and we'll leave some time at the end to answer them. So I mentioned the, the Red Panda GSMP and this is I think another topic that unless you work at a zoo or unless you work in conservation, you may not really be familiar with what that really is. So could you kind of just tell us what the Red Panda Global Species Management Plan is and what your role has been? And I know you're currently the governor, right? Which yeah. assuming he's like the chair. <laughs> cool. oh, <yes. laughs> um, well, you know, it, it's a progression from the stud book because when you, we started with the stud book, by, uh, I think about the mid 1980s, Europe and North America developed breeding programs for red pandas, where the um, organization of the program was much stricter than it had been previously, where I was um, giving uh, you know, just suggestions with when we became a, a, a breeding program, I could uh, give more binding advice on which animals should go where and how they might be kept and so we developed that in in Europe there was one being developed in the, in North America another one um, in um, Australia and New Zealand uh, some in South Africa and Japan so and eventually India but that was much later so you you were having these these various regional programs that were getting uh, gradually more successful, um, and but some pro, in some programs certain lines of red pandas were doing well and uh, um, and getting uh, predominant in the population. So it seemed a good time to try and do some exchanges between these regions. And, and we started off before um, the GSMP was launched, so this is why I'm sort of going back a bit. Um, we started in the, the mid 90s to make a, uh, a species master plan for the Fulgans red pandas with uh, the regional programs that were already holding that species, so not Japan, which it was essentially holding the Chinese red pandas at that time. Um, and, and that involved discussing, you know, do we want to move animals, how the, each region is doing? You know, do you need to do something a bit more of this in one region and a bit more, a uh, bit less breeding in one area, a bit more breeding in another area? Uh, we we dis discussed how the regions were going and discussed and organized a few exchanges. Um, and 
it was organized in such a way that we'd come together and discuss what we would do but within each region the uh, regional coordinator was autonomous he didn't take um, any uh, instructions from me who was then the stud bookkeeper and the chair of this group and this as this program was reasonably successful and then we uh, another seven or eight years later we did a similar one also for the Chinese red panda and about in, in the, about 2010-2011 the World Association of Zoos was looking for a way to make global uh, to establish global breeding programs not just for red pandas but for other species because sometimes there were not enough individuals of a species in one region to form a, a viable population so unless you considered all of the animals on all of the continents together you wouldn't have a sustainable population um, and because the red panda had been working together as a, a, a group uh, with all the regions we were one of the the trial uh, global programs that were set up to see how it would work if they became a, a fi an official, officially recognized World Association of Zoos and Aquariums um, project. So there was, there was the red panda and the tiger and a couple of other species that were set up and they were called um, global species management plans. Um, and the idea was eventually that they would also become more integrated with conservation work um, and maybe reintroduction work, depending on the species and what was needed. Um, and which is one of the reasons why the link has developed with Red Panda Network, because we decided in the very first meeting of this Global Species Management Plan group, which was again the regional coordinators um, and a couple of external advisors, we decided that conservation in the field was, was as important and what could we do to support field conservation? One was raise money, the other was to uh, provide expertise for certain things. For example, this is, was in the red panda collaring. Some people from Rotterdam went to help uh, catch and advise on uh, the, the red pandas in Nepal, to advise on handling them and collaring them. And that was the based on the experience they gained in the zoo. Um, uh, and so, this, you, I say, you, uh, the zoos could provide money and they could provide expertise and they could also help publicize red pandas, uh, put more information on their zoo websites, pu publish articles, put them on the zoo social media. So that was the other thing that we felt we sh could and should do. Wow, yeah, this is so cool because I've read about the GSMP, but just having this, you know, exclusive insight into how it developed into what it is now. And I mean, it sounds like it was a lot to coordinate. Um, and it, so it sounds like there was a lot of people who were um, involved, which is good. But you mentioned, you mentioned a reintroduction. Um, and I, I know that part of the G, GSMP's objectives is to provide a backup population um, for, for wild red pandas. Is, is there an example of, of red pandas who have been reintroduced to the wild? Um, there have been some um, introduced from India, from Darjeeling Zoo. There were two females that were reintroduced, oh, I can't remember. Um, maybe about 15 years ago, I can't quite remember the date. And they were the basis of the film Cherubs of the Mist. Mm -hmm. um, and those two females uh, were introduced into the Singalila National Park, which is near Darjeeling and also links over the border to uh, the, the pit area in Nepal. Um, and one of those females they were both collared, as I remember. The first one female was killed quite early on by a leopard. And the other female did breed with a male, with a wild male. Um, they found the cubs 
um, but at some stage the mother moved the cubs and they don't know if they, they remain successful or not. I think they may have gone over the border into Nepal where they couldn't track them anymore. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot about uh, Cherubs of the Mist and um, that's the, uh, the pa I'm totally not gonna say this right, but it's the Padmaja Nadu Himalayan Zoological Park is, is yeah. the, is yeah, the that's, yeah. And, in Darjeeling. And, and they've now got another project and they've got uh, in the same national park where they, they've currently got a reintroduction area that's a sort of fenced off large area within the you know quite near the entrance of the national park where they've got two uh, pairs of pandas getting them habituated to living in the environment before they release them um, i don't know are they meant to be releasing them sometime this year i don't know if they've done so yet possibly and they're going to do the same with four uh, four animals two pairs in another national park um, next year uh, very that, cool that is the planning if uh, covid doesn't get in the way right right well those are really exciting plans um hopefully they they are able to happen and obviously another another level to all this is the gsmp also um through their work with zoos help to educate the public and raise awareness about uh threatened species and the need for their conservation yes that's what we we try to uh, encourage zoos and we try to give them information we try to help them yeah, put more information out there about red pandas excellent so we're actually getting a, a, a lot of questions which is great so i'm just going to jump to the last sort of uh topic i wanted to to chat about which is the the red panda eep forest guardian program um, and the EEP is, it stands for European Endangered Species Program. Um, I guess it maybe should be EESP, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, can you just sort of just tell us a little bit about it and maybe sort of what inspired you to start it? Okay, well this is, yeah. You know, um, GSMPs are meant to be hosted by one of the regions. Um, so as I, within the European region, was the convener of the Red Panda GSMP, I thought that, that Europe should be a leader in trying to raise mon money for Red Pandas in the field. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, I, looking at the website and discussing a few things with Brian, I thought maybe one of the things that the um, zoos could do would be to finance forest guardians. Um, so the, the idea of the program was to offer zoos at a sort of reasonably low rate of, of contribution. They could buy into a program to support 10 forest guardians, I think we started with. And, and you have to remember that certainly in, in Eastern Europe, there are some zoos and, and yeah, not even in just Eastern Europe, there are some smaller zoos which do not have a lot of excess money there. The most of their money goes into the day-to-day -day management and care of their animals. But on the other hand, you know, it's good to get them involved in a conservation program and they probably want to be. So by offering a, a package of forest guardians which they could buy into, they 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 have a buy-in into that the, into the um, conservation of red pandas. And then the idea is that over time, uh, they gradually, hopefully, will contribute more. And maybe one uh, in each individual zoo or a few zoos will each um, adopt their own forest guardian. And then you have this personal relationship, which I would like to see between a zoo and their own forest guardian. That's a sort of part of your, your zoo family, if you like, and, and that you are familiar with and you know a bit more. and you know, you know their family, you know their kids or whatever, then, then you're, you've got a buy-in that will hopefully keep the zoo supporting those forest guardians for a much longer period of time. That, yeah, that's such a, that's a, such a great approach. Um, I, yeah, I just love the idea of connecting on a personal level the, the, the zoo with the, the forest guardian. And, and if you're not 
aware of what our Forest Guardian program is, uh, Forest Guardians are local people who live in Red Panda Range, who we hire and train, um, and they monitor the forests where Red Pandas live, and they um, educate fellow villagers, and um, you know they they report poachers, they they dismantle traps uh, that are set for red pandas and other w wildlife. I mean, they're they're what we call the heart of our community-based programs. So um, yeah, the EEP program is awesome. And it, it, it's, as I mentioned before, it's raised a lot of money for our forest guardian program, which is just awesome. Um, so I just have a couple more questions that I wanna get out real quick before we go to the, uh, the comments. Um, so, what was it like studying mouse lemurs? I mean, I, I just got to know. Are they, are, are, they, are they as cute as they sound? I mean, I've seen photos of them and everything, but in person, I'm sure they're even cuter. They're, they're, they're cute. They weigh about <laughs> 60 grams. Um, so they are very, very small. They're yeah. nocturnal. They look a little bit, you know, if you're not familiar with them, they look like small bush babies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're really nice. I, but, you know, they're quite feisty. Someone once said if they were the size of, of uh, Alsatians or German Shepherds, they'd rule the world, you know. But they're, <laughs> they're, 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 yeah, they're, they're, they're nice animals, but they're nocturnal. So you have to, if you want to, uh, because I essentially am uh, interested in behavior. So we had them maintained on a reverse lighting so I could watch them. Their night was in my day. So I was at work and they were in the dark. <laughs> that sounds that sounds really cool. Yeah, they they they're nice animals as well. I, and for some I reason, thought, got I it. had the opportunity to hand raise a couple because their mothers neglected them. And you start with something about the size of your pinky finger that requires feeding every two hours, day and night. So it's quite quite challenging. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds cute but exhausting. And for yeah. some reason, them being feisty just makes them even cuter. I don't know. I don't know why. Small and feisty. That's <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. So, uh, switching gears to back to red pandas. What is your? What are some of your favorite things about red pandas? What What's your like favorite red panda fact? I love asking people this oh, question. Okay. I don't know. Do I have a favorite? <laughs> you probably know too many, huh? I, totally I know the that. thing I like most. <laughs> what I like most about them is their play behavior. Um, with the cubs and you know particularly fathers and cubs because uh, you know when I was working in Notre Dame and we were studying them I could stay in the zoo at night which was very nice because it was quiet and there were no no people there except me and and you know often young red pandas will follow their mother and attack her tail but when you see these really you know wrestling and and doing roly polies it's with the father or at least it was in Rotterdam. And it, it's some of the really the nicest play behavior I think I've ever seen. That's so cool. I mean, I, I didn't know that the fathers were that involved, or at least the ones that you were around at, at Rotterdam. Yeah, it's a way um, you keep them. Some people separate them, but with, with us, and I've seen other zoos with videos that they're on YouTube, which, with, which shows similar things. So it's not unique. So the, the, the fathers will play with the cubs. Right. But but that sounds like a unique mammal characteristic, right? The the father being so involved with with uh, the cubs. Well it's interesting because of course they're solitary and as far as we know right. the, the, the male is nowhere around. But I you know his home range will overlap with that of the mother so maybe they do come in contact every now and then and maybe they, they play in the wild. I really wouldn't know. That's so cool. I, I, I got to say, I think that's my new favorite red panda fact. So I'm going to steal that from you. And if anyone ever asks me that, I'm going to say that. Um, so, okay. Going over to Facebook, we're going to start diving into some of these questions. Um, I'm going to try to figure out who posted first. Um, let's see. It's not showing me all the comments for some reason. But we'll start with this one from Monica Conrad. 
what do you feel is the most pertinent information slash research needed still needed still about in situ populations uh, and for ex situ red pandas? Most of the inf yeah, I'm not sure that it's the same information for the two. I, I think you know for for in situ for in the field we really do need to know a lot more about the fragmentation and, and of the population and and the sizes of subpopulations and how viable they are. Um, we have and and the impact. You know, we we all say you know hydroelectric power is going to have an impact. Roads have an impact. We need to know something more about how much of an impact these things have um, so that we can act more um, yeah, proactively and um, know what we're dealing with in advance. So I think in the field, those things are probably the most important, uh, as well as you know, determining where the, the, you know, we know where some pandas are in Nepal, we know where some pandas are. In India, we, we don't have a, you know, there are spaces between where we've looked, if you like, that need to be filled in um, to see if there are pandas existing in these not studied areas yet. And in, in captivity, um, gosh, I mean, I think mostly in, mostly in, in, cap, in zoos these days, I mean, the red pandas are doing uh, very well now in most areas we have to try and limit their breeding because we you know you don't have enough zoo space to keep breeding animals endlessly so i think um well obviously there's many veterinary things that we could probably improve on but nothing that springs to mind particularly great yeah um yeah G good question and good answer we're getting some some Hellos from some friends here, Sabina and Carson the Red Panda, <laughs> who um, is actually the, the, the Red Panda, Carson is uh, in Woodland Park Zoo. Oh, yes, and um, our, our friend uh, Carolyn is, is, uh, is who manages that. And then um, let's see. Some people talking about how great the book is. They're using it for veterinary veterinary medicine um, school. And then... Thank you, and there's a veterinary update coming. Oh, very cool. Um, someone from Cleveland Metro Park Zoo. The book has provided me with so much information to pass on to visitors at the zoo. Thanks for making the book available to me and the general public. Um, that's Ollie Fulgens. Um, some people from Nepal. I know I saw some other questions here. I'm just having to go down. Oh, okay. Compliments are good. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so this one, speaking of friends, this is Justin Fairchild, who's uh, one of our supporters, and he was also on an eco trip um, a couple of years ago in Nepal, where he saw a few red pandas. And his question is: Was the stud book always separated by Fulgens Stiani? The Nepalese Chinese red pandas. Yes, but in the beginning, I think we only had about two Stiani. The bulk of the Chinese red pandas started to come um, into zoos in the 90s, and when I started, uh, just before the the CITES um, uh, upgrade to Appendix One, there was a lot of Chinese red pandas that were coming in, and let, yeah, let's say between 1988 and 1993. Um, so, and, and from the beginning, they've always been separate, even the few that already were in zoos. So no crossbreeding, no hybrids, as far as I know. Well, that, that actually brings us to the next question, which is from our country director, Ong Piri Sherpa. Hello, and, Ong. <laughs> hi, Ong. And he's asking, has there been cross mating between the so-called Chinese red panda and the Himalayan red pandas? Not, uh, not, uh, what's the word? Not, not on purpose. If someone misidentified <laughs> them, um, that could have happened, but it's not, I've never had um, a cross, a hybrid recorded in the stud book. So as far as I know, never. 
Ne never intentionally, at least, right? No, that's um, So someone's asking if the stud book is available online. Um, now it's all, um, it's not, uh, I mean, yes, it has been available online um, on the uh, Rotterdam Zoo website. Um, and I'm not sure how, what is going to happen with that in the future, because in, in the past you needed a written stud book. Uh, but now there is a global database, which all the managers can get into and find out who is who. I don't know that there will be continued a physical publication that will be available. I don't know what the plans are. And the uh, Car Carson the Red Panda, Carolyn, uh, is saying that the Willem Park Zoo has three warty pigs and that they are pretty awesome. <laughs> Good, I agree. Well done, Carson. <laughs> it's amazing that Carson can use a computer, huh? Yeah. <laughs> if his claws don't get caught. <laughs> and Justin Fairchild uh, posted his really cool red pan redpandafinder.com, which is a really amazing database he put together of uh, Stiani red pandas in Asia. Okay, interesting. Which, yeah, it's really cool. And then let's see if there's, what do you feel? So this is from Monica Conrad. What do you feel is the most, I already asked that question. You did. It, uh, for some reason it's out of order now. Okay, I think I got to most of these. Let's see if I missed any. Thank you everyone for sending so many questions. This is great. Seeing that there's quite a few red pandas in captivity now to improve genetic diversity in the wild, would a large number of young red pandas Ship to Darjeeling area or similar be advisable? Um, I, th I think the question is essentially, would, could, could the global zoo community provide some um, gen genetic diversity to the um, red pandas that are potentially going to be released in Darjeeling? Um, to to those or Singalina. To yeah, you mean the, uh, the pandas in the Singalina? Uh, oh, he might be clarifying. I'm not really sure exactly what the question is, to be honest. Um, yeah, well, maybe we'll, it may, maybe he'll clarify, um, but we'll move on. Let's see. Um, why is, red pandas are one of my favorite animals. This is from, uh, Liana Burden, why is it important to conserve them just as much as any other animals? Good question. Because all animals are probably are worth biodiversity is worth preserving. So you have you try to preserve as much and as many species as possible. So they have as much importance as everything else. Yeah. Yeah, great answer. I, I like to say that red pandas are unique, important, and endangered. Um, so those are all reasons to, um, they're obviously unique. They're, you know, they're in their own taxonomic group. Um, there's a lot of unique, you know, physical um, and behavioral characteristics. And um, they're important. They're, a, you know, they're a flagship species. They're an indicator species of the Himalayan um, landscape, which is obviously a really important um, region, and they're unfortunately endangered as well with, you know, fewer than 10,000 remaining in the wild. So, um, but I like Angela's answer too. Um, yeah, I think, I think we got to all the questions. Um, so, yeah, well, this has been fantastic, Angela. Thank you very much for for chatting with me today. And if anyone wants to learn everything there is to know about red pandas <laughs> by this book, the uh, probably the easiest way to, to purchase it is through the um, publisher, the El El Elsevier. So if you just go to the Elsevier website and- Or Amazon, it's on Amazon. Or Amazon, yeah. Um, and you can actually support us through Amazon Smile if you do purchase this through uh, Amazon. So uh, just keep that, keep that in mind. Um, 
yeah, if you have, if you have any more questions that I, I didn't get to, you can email me at terrence at redpandanetwork.org. And I, if it's not something I can answer, I can pass it on to Angela, and I'm sure she'll uh, provide some, some awesome scientific background and expertise. And yeah, um, thanks so much, Angela. This has been great. And thank you everyone who joined us. This has been a lot of fun. It's been, it's been really great chatting with someone, pretty much the resource that I have, that and the, our you know, conservation and research team in Nepal. Whenever I need insight into red pandas um, for, for my work, you know, you're who I go to and as, as well as um, a few other board members and, and, our, uh, and our team in Nepal. So, but yeah, thank you for everything that you've done for red pandas and for red panda network and um, for being here. Thanks, Angela. Thank you and thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Take care. Have a great afternoon. Or yeah, sorry, good, late evening. after evening. After evening. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes, I think I'll let my dog out. She's looking like she's crossing her legs. You might want to let that red panda behind you out too. Uh, he, he's <laughs> <trained>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.